we are going to discuss David, your piece, After Warming, and of course, obviously coming on the heels of all of your work, including your book, The Uninhabitable Earth, my question to you is, I feel like I'm having a hard time feeling optimistic about the world right now, but your piece, which is not always the case in your work, made me feel optimistic. Why? Well, things are actually looking a lot better than they did a couple of years ago. I think, you know, it's important to keep in mind when it comes to warming that when things are starting to look better, it's looking better off of a very, very grim baseline. And we're still likely to be living in a world that, you know, our grandparents would have been horrified to see humans living in. Um, and yet the path that we're on now in 2021 um, looks a lot better and more comfortable and more manageable than a path that we thought we were on a couple of years ago, mostly because coal is really dying out and because the renewable energy revolution has made um, future decarbonization seem much easier and more manageable and more affordable than it seemed likely to be not that long ago. And because of all the political agitation that's happened all around the world over the last year or two, making it really hard for political leaders, but also corporate leaders to still fight the wars of denial. I think we've sort of effectively turned the page on that. There's basically nobody with any power or any stature anywhere in the world who is arguing about the fact of climate change. Um, that's not to say that, you know, from here on out, everything's gonna be smooth. Um, there are still forces of delay um, and they're you know, quite profound. Um, but I think unfortunately, unfortunate as it is, like we do have to count this sort of end of denial as a meaningful step forward that allows us to think a little more ambitiously about what actions we can take now as a, you know, as a nation, but also as a, as a planet. And I think we're you know, in a kind of an exciting spot actually given where we thought we'd be a few years ago, um, looking ahead at the world in 2021 and thinking, you know, two thirds of um, the world's carbon emissions are now formally committed to getting zeroed out over the next couple of decades. Um, and even those that aren't, haven't made those promises, even the countries that haven't made those promises, the market systems in those places are moving quickly enough that make us think that they'll likely sort of hit the same target. So, you know, we used to think that, I used to think that this was an unbelievable, you know, challenge, generational challenge that was going to require the entire remaking of the world order. And that's still true. But we're starting to actually do that work now. And um, given how difficult and unlikely it seemed not that long ago, I think, you know, an alarmist like me at least has to, has to count that as some progress. As a fellow alarmist, I will take non-denialism as a as progress. You talked about the last year being kind of a breakthrough in a lot of ways. I'm curious, was it connected to the pandemic? Is there something pandemic related that uh, has, has aided this? What is it about the last year? Well, I think there's some long-term trajectories and then there's some short-term trajectories. So long-term, you know, renewable prices have been falling really dramatically. And that means that any policymaker who's considering, you know, making spending some subsidy on the fossil fuel business or investing in the electrification and renewableification of, of their energy systems. Um, those calculus, that calculus now looks much more appealing um, if you're, you know, to, to, to be investing in, in the green side of things rather than the dirty side of things. And that, that's been ongoing for a decade or a little bit more, where those prices are falling. But I think what happened in the pandemic is that really all of the governments of the world um, began loosening their purse strings in a really dramatic way and started spending much more money than any of them had ever felt comfortable spending really since the height of World War II. And you heard a lot over the last few years of climate advocates talking about the need for a World War II scale mobilization. COVID actually sort of produced that. Um, we are now spending stimulus money at that scale as though we were all engaged in a really meaningful um, global conflict just in order to prop up our economies and make sure that um, you know the, the populations of these countries are um, doing at least relatively comfortably given the economic the broader economic conditions and then once those governments are spending that money you start to think okay well we may as well be we might as well be investing these um, this money in projects that will make us richer and safer and um, stabilize the future planet of the climate and that thinking has been a little more prevalent in some parts of the world than others. The EU has been the sort of most um, pronounced um, in their, you know, directing stimulus spending to climate initiatives, but you're starting to see a lot more of it in the US and the Biden administration. And I think it has something to do with, you know, the, the kind of most significant event of the last year, I think was 
China um, announcing a much more ambitious timeline to net zero in their emissions. I think that has to do with the fact that they understand that in part because of the pandemic and the global economy, they're going to have to be doing a lot more, much more aggressive and directed spending even than they've done in the last decade. And I think we might as well be sort of um, directing that money towards this other target and, and kill two birds with one stone. So you talked about the United States. I think that we have all had this idea, particularly even during the election, even the Georgia runoffs, that you know we were uh, voting for Senate control because the United States has to... Uh, the, Trump is a climate denialist, and the United States has to has to change where we're going to lose our world. But one of the things I find kind of interesting is the United States' role in this. You now, obviously, they're back in the Paris Accords, but it feels like the United States' role in this is not nearly quite as large as perhaps the United the Americans think it is. Yeah, I think in general there's a kind of American narcissism where um, people think you know, Americans think that um, as the U.S. goes, the world goes, and they tend to blame. Um, the Republican Party in the U.S. and American fossil fuel companies for um, the slow pace of change that we've seen to this point. And, you know, it is undeniably true that the U.S. has done less than it should by any historical standard. We've produced the most carbon of any country in the history of the world, and many of the biggest oil companies are based in the U.S. On the other hand, this is a country that today only produces 15 percent of the world's emissions, and that's a share that's falling, which means the whole trajectory of the planet is going to be determined much more by the rest of the world than what happens within the U.S. And even within the U.S., a lot of the kind of emissions trajectories, um, you know, that we're on now have, are, you know, it's really complicated, determined by many forces, not just what kind of action the Senate takes. Um, market forces are quite powerful. There's also executive action, regulatory oversight. There are the courts. Um, there are you know, the consumer dynamics and what, what buyers want, all of these things play a role. And so I think we've, we've sort of, in our eagerness to see easy villains, we've pointed the finger at um, American Republicans as the forces of delay and denial. Um, and I think that that sort of overstates their significance and also lets the rest of us, both American liberals and people around the world off the hook. This is an incredibly challenging, complicated problem, and we all have to be moving somewhat in a coordinated fashion and a quite aggressive fashion to sort of give us a chance of avoiding what scientists have called catastrophic warming. But ultimately, um, there's going to be much more impact from things happening outside the U.S. borders than inside the U.S. borders, so much so that in some cases, to some degree, the most impactful thing that American, the Americans can do, that the American legislator, legislature can do, might be investing in R&D that can be sort of more easily distributed around the world than say a carbon tax policy or a ban on the internal combustion engine, which is necessarily uh, stops at, at the nation's borders.